Okay, so we now move on to section 3.8 about extensions of linear maps. And I said a little bit about this at the end of last time uh, with a little brief introduction and mentioned these things called uh, support functionals. So let's start to flesh out some of this stuff. We won't have time, unfortunately, to give complete proof of everything, but I will try to indicate one of the the interesting idea um, that helps you to boost yourself up by one dimension when you're trying to extend linear functionals. So we'll have a look at that. Right, so a uh, very elementary uh, revision of extension and restriction. So you've just got a couple of functions defined taking values in C, but one is defined on a smaller set and one is defined on a bigger set, then one may be a restriction of the other, in which case the other one is the extension of the first. So G is an extension of F if it agrees with F on the smaller set, but G may have, G is going to be defined on the bigger set, so it will have some other values as well. So, so quite often one either restricts a function defined on a bigger set or one extends a function defined on a smaller set to, to make it defined on a bigger set. And then one's interested sometimes in, you've got a function with nice properties, can you extend it to still have nice properties on a bigger set? Um, of course, the other way around, quite often if you've got a function with nice properties and you restrict it, it quite often automatically has nice properties. Like if you have a continuous function and you restrict it to a smaller set, and then use a subspace topology, it'll still be continuous on the smaller set. So that sort of thing is, uh, is automatic. But on the other hand, if you've got a function defined on a smaller set that's continuous, it's not necessarily the case that you can extend it to be defined on a bigger set and keep it continuous. Though we'll see some information about that later when we come to the Tietze extension theorem, which gives circumstances under which you can do such extensions. Anyway, this section we're looking at extensions of linear maps. So there you are, we have this notion of extension and restriction which are sort of going the opposite directions. So we'll have that uh, G is an extension of F if and only if F is a restriction of G to A. Now the first result doesn't need the axiom of choice or anything and it tells you that if you've got a continuous linear map defined um, taking values in a Banach space and it's defined on some subspace then you can always extend it to be defined on the closure while preserving the operator norm. So what's going on here you've got so you're, you've got a subspace of a norm space and you're taking values in a Banach space. So your linear map defined so far on some subspace of a norm space. And ideally you want to try and extend this linear map to be defined on a bigger space. And what you get for three is that you can extend it up to the closure of the subspace. So let's have a look. Um, just to remind you what's going on. Um, we know that if you've got a linear subspace of a norm space, it becomes a norm space as well, just by restricting the norm. So that's uh, one of the things we'll be doing, and, and we'll be doing that by default. So when I talk about a linear functional defined on a subspace and extending it to be a bit more, I mean the subspace is given the restricted norm and so on, and then you try and extend it to be defined on a bigger space. Um, linear functionals, we know, we've been talking about linear functionals quite a lot now, and we know what norm you give to the continuous dual space E star, we use the operator norm, um, and of course we'll be using that again in this section. So here we are, here's our setting. I've got a, a norm space X at a Banach space Y at a linear subspace of X called E, and its closure which I call F. Then, as I said before, we restrict the norm to E, that makes E a norm space. We restrict the norm to F, and that makes F a norm space. Now suppose T is a continuous linear map from E to Y. 
So it's not defined on the whole of Y. It's only defined on E, but it is continuous. And it's a linear map, taking values in this Banach space. Then there's a unique continuous extension, T tilde, which is a continuous linear map from the closure. F is the closure of E. You can extend it in a unique way to the closure, and the operator norm gets preserved. In particular, if you've got a continuous linear functional defined on this subspace E, you can extend that continuous linear functional in a unique way to the closure of E, which is F. And so you start with something that's in E star, then you get something in F star, and you don't lose anything. You're, this norm is the operator norm, of course. I don't always say which norm I've got, but remember, when we're talking about the norm of a linear functional, we'll be using the operator norm. Now, I'm going to prove this 3.30 to you, but this is a this is a rather weak result when it comes to linear functionals because, as we're going to see, here is one of the most important results in functional analysis. I wish we had time to do a full proof of it, but I'm going to have to leave it to you to read all the details in, in the books. But I will give you an indication of one of the key ideas. So it's the harm banach theorem for extensions of continuous linear functionals. This doesn't, unfortunately, work for linear operators in general, but it does work for linear functionals. And uh, so if you've got some continuous linear functional defined on a subspace, then it turns out that you can always extend it to give you a continuous linear functional on the whole space, which has got the same operator norm. Again, if I don't say, that I obviously mean the operator norm, because that's the norm we use on linear functionals. However, this time the extension isn't unique. It, you often have a lot of choice um, as you go. Um, a huge amount of choice uh, as you extend the functional. Um, and I'll try to indicate something again about why that happens. So you get to extend uniquely to the closure of E, but by the time you go past that and go and extend it to the whole space, then you may have a lot of choice, but you can still do it and you can still preserve the operator norm. OK, well, I'll tell you, first of all, I'm going to prove theorem 3.30. Then we're going to have a look at some of the uh, consequences of the harm banach theorem, which I mentioned last time. So here's the proof of 3.30. So we know that T is in um, B of E, Y. Um, so we can set C equals norm T op, giving um, norm T x minus t y is more equal to c norm x minus y for all x and y in E. Now, I'm not going to write down where all these norms are taken this time. But these ones here are, um, take, I will remind you that uh, Tx and Ty are in Y, so this must be the norm in Y, whereas X and Y are in E, so we must be taking the norm in E, which is the same as the restriction of the norm in X. So, so why, don't I, why don't I do it just for once again? Um, that's the norm in Y, that's the norm in X. But if I miss it out, if I miss it out, then you figure out where they are in context.
So let um, x be in f, which is E closure, then there exists a sequence xn in E converging to x, because that's the sequence version of closure. F is a closure in X of E. Well, XN is in a Cauchy sequence because it's convergent. Convergent sequences are always Cauchy. But norm Txn minus Txn in Y is less than equal to this constant times norm Xn minus Xl in X. So Txn, n equals 1 to infinity, is Cauchy in Y. Since Y is complete, Um, TXN converges. In Y, so we've got XN tending to X. TXN is converging to something. So we'd like to just say that that's what T tilde of X is. Remember, T of X is not defined if X is in F and not in E. T so far is only defined on E. We took an X in E closure, namely F, and now we've approximated it with a sequence from E where we know what T does. We'd like to extend T to be defined at X, and so we would like to define T tilde of X to be the limit as N tends to infinity of TXN with XN as above. We do know that you can find a sequence XN in X tending to E and that then TXN will converge in Y. So it looks plausible, but what might the problem be? What have we... In order to say that this is actually a definition, what do we have to check? We took just any old sequence Xn in E converging to X. So X probably won't be in E, in fact. So we won't be able to prove that X is in E because if E is not closed then X might well be an element of F that isn't in E. So we won't be able to prove that X is in E. Okay. All we can do is find a sequence in E converging to X. Okay. And then we can do this, and we can attempt to make this definition, but there could be a problem. If I want, if I want to claim this is well-defined, I need to be sure that I'll always get the same answer no matter which such sequence Xn I try. Suppose I took a different sequence Xn in E that converged to, to X. How do I know I get the same answer? So the, so the problem, um, is this well defined? Suppose X prime N in E is another one.
converging to x. Do they have the same limit when you look at Txn? Well, fortunately, the answer is yes, um, because, again, Xn and, Xn and Xn prime are very close for large n because they're both tending to x. Since Xn tends to x and Xn prime tends to x, we have Xn minus Xn prime tends to zero. in X, or in E even, so uh, Txn minus Txn prime tends to zero in Y, so they do have the same limit. Uh, it's X prime N, isn't it, the way I've written it. Xn prime or X prime n doesn't really matter as long as uh, uh, the prime seems to be moving around. But you got the idea. It's another sequence. So you can make this definition. Whichever sequence Xn you choose from E that converges to X Txn will have the same limit. So now you can define that, and you can define T tilde x. So we now have T tilde x equals the limit n tends to infinity of Txn for all such xn. What's the first thing we need, by the way? I want this to be an extension. So, for it to be an extension, what, what must it satisfy? What's our definition of an extension? It must agree with T on E. Well, that's easy, fortunately. Note. If x is in E, then taking xn equals x, that's a sequence in E converging to x. So that's x, x, x. Definitely converges to x. Um, we see that t tilde of x is equal to the limit that n tends to infinity of Txn, which is the limit of the constant, limit n tends to infinity of the constant Tx, which is Tx. So that's good, it agrees. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to check that it's linear, and that it's got the... Um, Check that T is linear. Let, I can do the operator norm. For the operator norm, uh, it's clear that the new operator norm can't be less than it was before. Uh, norm, the new one has to be at least as big as the old one. That's because you have all the old vectors of, of norm 1 available. And T tilde agrees with T on E. 
So however bad T can be on E, T tilde can be just as bad as that on E. So T, just look at elements of E, you see that the operating norm of T tilde is at least as big as the operating norm of T. So the other way, and this is always the case for restrictions. So this always happens for restrictions. Restrictions, extensions. The restriction can never have a bigger operator norm than the extension. So we want to look at it the other way around. Now let X be in F. And oh, remember that was, that was C, remember? That operator norm was called C. Now let X in F and choose xn in E with xn tends to x, then we may not have proved this. If you haven't ever checked this, um, it's an easy exercise. It's a bit like some of the things we talked about with metrics. Um, the norm function will always continue with respect to norm. So when xn tends to x, then norm xn tends to norm x. So we have the norm of t tilde x equals the norm of the limit as n tends to infinity of txn equals the limit as n tends to infinity of the norm of txn but norm of Txn is more equal to C norm Xn, which tends to C X, that C norm X, as n tends to infinity. So the norm of T tilde X is uh, is less equal to C times the norm of X, which is what we wanted. So you've still got the same operator norm. But you should check the linearity bit. But it's the usual thing. Um, you're trying to check linearity, then you've got some things you're trying to check it on. Well, you don't know yet for those, so you take sequences from E tending to the relevant objects, and then you have linearity there, so, so then you just take the limit. And the limit of a linear combination is a linear combination of the limits, so that's no problem. OK, so there's the bit you get for free, which is extending to the closure. And then there's the much more complicated business of trying to extend further than that, which is something that you can only guarantee to do for linear functionals. Right, uh, let, me just, let me just go back to the statement of Harm Banach. So again, this is, this is a, a far more interesting result, the fact that you can extend to the whole space, not just to the closure, when you're dealing with continuous linear functionals. Now, this has got some very important implications for us. Well, it's got very important implications throughout functional analysis and, and then all the applications of functional analysis to other areas as well. So it's a very important result. Um, if you're dealing with a norm space that is not separable, then this needs something like the axiom of choice to prove it. If you're dealing with a norm space that is separable, then you can do it without the axiom of choice because you can start by um, doing a, a finding, a, a, you can start with a countable dense subset and then take its linear span. And, that, and under those circumstances, you only have to do a sequence of extensions. And Han, the, one part of the Hahn-Banach theorem is how to extend by one dimension. 
And that doesn't need the active choice at all. So if you've got a linear functional defined so far and you want to extend it by one dimension, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, then that doesn't need the active choice. But then, once you know how to extend by one dimension, Zorn's lemma does the rest for you. Um, you say, extend by one dimension and one dimension and one dimension and keep going and try to get as far as possible. In other words, you look for a maximally extended linear functional in a certain careful way. But because you can always extend by one dimension more, a maximally extended linear functional has to be defined on the whole space. So that's how the Harm-Banach works. But if, you just, if, you could do, if you've got a countable dimensional space, um, or a countable dimensional subspace, you could just use the extend by one dimension trick repeatedly on the sequence, and that successfully defines your linear functional extension with the same norm on the countable dimensional subspace. And then this extension to closure takes you home if that countable dimensional subspace is dense. So, the full version needs an active choice argument, Zorn's lemma, but the separable case, um, and in particular, the finite dimensional case is already interesting, and I mentioned this before. The finite dimensional case, you just have to use the extend by one dimension a few times. A countable dimensional case, you extend a sequence of times beyond that, uh, and then you can go to the closure. But after that, you need to uh, use the actual choice. Right. OK, so let's have a look at some of these implications. And this is the one I mentioned before about support functionals. So suppose you've got a norm space, and you've got a non-zero element in it, which, of course, you might not have if it's a zero space, but uh, I said suppose you've got a non-zero element in it called x. Then suppose you take a functional with, of course, operator norm 1. The most you could possibly get for the modulus of phi of x would be norm x, because that's the definition of the operator norm. Of course, uh, if you do achieve it, of course, you can always multiply by some constant of norm 1 to make phi of x non-negative. If phi of x was some complex number, you can multiply by a complex number of, of modulus 1 to make it non-negative. Um, so the fact that there's no modulus signs in here shouldn't surprise you too much. This just means that I've scaled by a constant with modulus 1. The interesting bit is the fact that you could achieve the, uh, achieve the norm that you're guaranteed to be able to find a linear functional which does manage to be as big as it possibly could be at x. This is not at all obvious. Um, and such a thing is called a support functional, and, and they're very useful in functional analysis through, throughout. Uh, now, how can you deduce that result from the harm banach theorem? Well, the answer is you start by defining your linear functional on just a one-dimensional subspace spanned by x. So deduction of corollary 3.32 from the harm banach theorem. HB for harm banach You set E to be the linear span of X, which is, of course, equal to alpha X, where alpha is a scalar. And now you start by defining a linear functional there. So you define psi in E star by psi of alpha x equals alpha. x is non-zero, so uh, this is well defined. And I don't mean alpha, I mean alpha norm x.
Uh, well, I claim it's an E star. Well, it can't fail to be because E is finite dimensional. It's bound to be. But actually, the operator norm is 1. Then note that uh, psi of uh, x itself is just norm x. And the modulus of psi of x, the modulus of psi of alpha x, which is alpha norm x, which of course is less equal to alpha norm x, which is a funny thing to say, uh, but let's say that's less equal to the norm of alpha x. So that the operator norm of psi is exactly equal to 1. This second bit tells you it's less or equal to 1, but because x is non-zero, this first bit tells you that the norm is actually equal to 1. OK, so that gives you a psi in E star defined on this one-dimensional space. But now, by the harm banner theorem, you can extend it to the whole thing There exists a phi in x star with um, phi restricted to E equals psi. It's extending psi. And with the same operator norm. And then since phi of x, e phi of x equals psi of x equals x, uh, equals norm x, we've done it. So once you've got the Harm-Banach theorem, then you can look at some special cases like one-dimensional subspaces and come up with some nice linear functionals. And now we, that means that we've got plenty. We've got enough linear functionals to, uh, to attack non-zero elements with and get non-zero values with, but not only that, you can actually get as, as big a value as you possibly could with a linear function of such a norm. And those are the support functionals. And the relationship between elements and their support functionals and, and so on is quite well studied in Banach space theory. Any questions about that result? Obviously, we haven't proved harm Banach, and we won't prove harm Banach in full. But do people understand the statement of the harm Banach theorem and have seen how to apply it here? Which is the most important thing. The statement of the harm Banach theorem and its applications, that's examinable. But the proof of the harm Banach theorem, we won't be doing in full. So it will be a non examinable proof of the harm Banach theorem, though I am going to show you one of the ideas from it. So now we come back to the natural or canonical embedding from x into x double dual. And we mentioned this already. So this is the natural embedding, also called the canonical embedding, of a norm space into its double dual or bidual. Remember, that's uh, the dual of x, x star star is the dual of x star. Can you remind me anything interesting that happens? Suppose x is maybe an incomplete norm space. What can you tell me about x star? So if x is incomplete, might x star still be incomplete? Do you know? Or do we know something about x star? Sorry? We do know. We do know because it's the continuous linear maps into a Banach space. And the continuous linear maps into a Banach space always gives you a complete space, even if the original space is incomplete. So it's rather important to know that even when x is incomplete, x star is complete. Of course, 
x star star is then also complete because it's the dual of another norm space. It ha x star star happens to be the dual of a complete norm space, but it doesn't matter, it's still complete. So note, x star and x star star are, com are Banach spaces, even if x isn't. So, what is this x hat operator? x hat is in the bidual, so x hat has to be a linear functional defined on the linear functionals, which means that you have to be able to find x hat of a linear functional. Fortunately, x hat just means evaluate at me. In general, hat means evaluate at me. <laughs> Whenever I use this hat notation, it's going to mean that the, the thing you have is to evaluate at the thing that's being hatted. So x hat of phi means take phi of x. That makes sense because x is in x and phi is in x star. So you can do phi of x. And so this defines what x hat of phi is. And uh, it's rather easy to see some property of this. So note, mod x hat of phi is mod phi of x is small or equal to norm x norm phi. from which you deduce that x hat is bounded because x hat is being applied to phi so you want to know how, how big can mod x hat of phi be compared to mod phi, norm of phi. Well this says that modulus of x hat of phi is no more than norm x times the norm of phi so your conclusion is that norm x hat in its operator norm which is a different operator norm, this is in the operator norm on x star star, is less equal to norm x. However, what's not obvious is that you get equality. But that comes from the harm banach theorem. So let's have a look at the result. This is, in fact, an isometric linear map from x into x double dual. Now, it's rather easy to show it's linear. So I'll leave it to you to see it's linear. And now we know it's continuous because we have that norm x hat op is less than or equal to norm x in x from above. And the linearity of this map is easy. That's an easy exercise. Because everything inside is linear. So if you take x1 plus x2, and you want to look at x1 hat plus x2 hat, well, you're going to be adding the values. Um, so it's, it's not going to be a problem. And so on. Um, so, but what's non-trivial is the equality in the norms, and that comes from harm banach theorem. The equality of norms, norm x hat op equals norm x in x, is from harm banach Note that uh, if x equals 0, this is obvious. For x not equal to 0, we have lesser equals already.
So to prove greater equal, we'll use a support functional. So we'll let phi be a support functional for x. Then norm phi is 1. It's the operator norm, but it's a norm in x star. And the modulus of x hat of phi uh, equals the modulus of phi of x. Um, but the support functional is chosen to have operator norm 1 and to have phi of x equals norm x. So that was what our support functional, our support functionals did. So we found an element whose norm is 1 and where x hat takes it to something, takes it to value norm x. So that tells you that the norm of x hat in the operator norm is at least norm x. And you finished. So it's an isometric linear embedding. And that will be very useful to us when we move into the next section on completions, though it, it gives one way to explain how to do a completion of a norm space. Um, it's not the only way to do it, and you don't need the axiom of choice in order to get completions of norm spaces. But, of course, it does give a, a rather clean way of doing it. So we'll see how that works. Now, sometimes this natural embedding is onto. It's an isometric linear map from x into x double star. You don't always get everything. Sometimes you get everything and sometimes not. So, LP goes to LP star star equals LQ star equals LP. But you have to take that with a pinch of salt, because those equals are some isometric linear isomorphisms. So you have to check that these are what you think they are, but they actually are. So it does work. Um, with LP, you're OK, but C0, um, that goes into L1 star, which is equal to L infinity. Um, C0 star is L1, L1 star is L infinity. And this is exactly the map you get. And C0 is not the same as L infinity. So if it is surjective, then we normally say x equals x star star, using this natural isometric linear isomorphism. And then x is a so-called reflexive Banach space. And notice it has to be a Banach space because x star star is complete. So this can't happen for an incomplete norm space. Um, for an incomplete norm space, mapping into a, isometrically into a Banach space, you're going to end up with a subspace that isn't closed. OK. I think the best thing I can do is say that the rest of the chapter... Is an the rest of this section is an optional reading exercise on the harm banner theorem. The rest of 3.8 is an optional reading exercise. I think I won't say more about the details of the harm banner theorem. Um, it is a very nice result. Um, you can look at the details in a book. But what you do need to know is the statement of the harm banner theorem and how to apply it.
So there's the end of your optional reading exercise. Okay, um, so I'll see you again this afternoon and we'll move on to uh, section 3.9.